You know, tomorrow, millions of people are going to celebrate Martin Luther King Day. They're going to gather together. Some will treat it as a holiday and uh, have time with their family or just spend time relaxing. Others are going to gather in groups uh, and listen to speeches and listen to uh, talks as they recommit or continue uh, their work towards what Martin Luther King Day is actually about, about the ongoing work towards racial unity and overcoming segregation in our world. Here at Faith Community Church, we are committed to multicultural unity, bringing all people from all cultures together because we believe that is a biblical picture, a picture of what heaven might look like. And so I'd like to invite you to join me as we pray about Martin Luther King Day, as we pray about the work uh, in Martin Luther King Day, and specifically as we pray for ourselves and our role in that. Please won't you join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, thinking about a day and a man who was committed to your kingdom, a man who uh, fought for the rights of those who did not have any. And Father, we come before you now, not just to honor Martin Luther King, but to pour out our requests to you and ask for your guidance. Lord, it is appropriate that we enter into a time of confession. While we support, fight for, and proclaim unity today, our history shows us that not all Christians were in support of the work of Martin Luther King Jr. While we hope we would be different, uh, if we had lived then, we know all too well that we are broken and fallen and that we too may find ourselves on the wrong side of justice. That might be because of ignorance, Lord. It might be because of willful resistance or embedded bias within us. But we are going to take a moment, Lord, and confess to you our sins and failures in fighting for justice for all people and for unity for all people. Lord God, forgive us for the roles we have played in perpetuating racism or hatred or brokenness. Lord, forgive us. We pray too for the ongoing work of equality for all people, for all people of all colors. We each have a role to play in that, uh, Heavenly Father. We pray for our role that we would be strengthened to speak and act in accordance with the directives of Scripture and the command of Jesus, to love one another as He loved us. We pray for those whose work and commitments put them on the front line of this effort. We pray for courage and success in the fight for justice and the work to bring all people to unity. We don't want cheap unity, Lord. We know that justice needs to be met. But we do want unity. So help us meet justice and be united. So we pray for grace that when we fail or are failed by others, that we would be able to forgive and continue. And we pray for the steadfastness to keep going despite those failures. Lord, we pour out our requests to you and ask you to be with those as they struggle and fight. Lord, we are not where we were. We have progressed, we have moved, there are new laws in place and people are experiencing freedoms that once were not theirs. And we see the work and growth towards the ideals of God's kingdom where a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people and language might gather and worship God. We are not where we were, but we are also not where we want to be. We are not where you want us to be. So we ask for you, God, to continue the work of bringing us together so that we might grow closer to each other and towards that day when we have racial and cultural unity. Heavenly Father, we ask for you to come and provide for us right here in this community. Open our eyes to the opportunities we have. Open our ears to the cries for justice. Open our hearts to be compassionate. And may we do the work that you have set aside for us to do. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that prayer. Well, we're continuing our series on kingdom stories, and uh, we're going into week two of that. Now, in 2020, the strangest thing happened during the COVID pandemic. 
as we saw shutdowns, as people were locked down and, and people stayed home, a, a remarkable craze began to happen. It was called the sourdough craze. For some reason, people who were stuck at home decided that they wanted to start making sourdough. And I, I don't make sourdough, but here's one of the things that's quite remarkable. In order to get sourdough done properly, you need to have a sourdough starter of yeast. And that takes some care and effort. It requires uh, working on this little baby starter, kind of like a puppy, pouring in each day, keeping it alive, feeding it yeast and feeding it again and again. It, there were so many people doing sourdough starters that the stores ran out of yeast. They ran out of this simple little packet uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of material. And so people began to pour into doing sourdough starters. They worked at it. And as happened with all sorts of things that people are doing new, some people succeeded and others mourned the loss of their sourdough starter. I don't know, did you start something like that? Uh, do you still have your sourdough starter going? Pretty crazy, right? But here's the interesting thing about these sourdough starters. Back in the time of Jesus, when he was teaching these parables, many people had sourdough starters. You see, they couldn't go to a store and buy a packet of yeast. So families would have a starter pack of, of yeast and they would feed that continually and use a portion in their bread and they would continue to use it. In fact, it was considered a great wedding gift that when families got, uh, got united together, they would sometimes give them the gift of a sourdough starter, a portion of, uh, from each of the families so that they could begin with some yeast so they could bake bread and feed their families. It was such a common day thing that it led to a story that Jesus shared. And it's where we pick up our stories today as we look at these kingdom stories, which we call parables. Before we read the parables for today, and as we dive into them, I want to remind us about what parables are. Parables are memorable stories of everyday activities, but they're not just told to recount uh, everyday things. They are stories told of memory day, everyday activities in order to communicate a truth to us. And what Jesus shared about the parables is that when we listen to them, they actually become mirrors to our souls. They become mirrors reflecting where we are in our walk with Christ. And as such, they have power to shape us. Last week, we looked at uh, some uh, beginning parables, kind of later on in the chap, uh, Matthew 13. And this week, I had heard from a number of faith groups who began to dive into this. In fact, my own faith group, we had a, a riveting, uh, exciting discussion around these parables. And I mentioned to our faith group as we were debating what we thought uh, the interpretations were, that I thought Jesus would be proud of us, smiling down at us, that we were doing the hard work of wrestling with his stories, of trying to make sense of them. Parables invite us to question. And we were doing that. We were coming with questions to these parables, trying to understand what they're like. Now, here's just a warning. You can debate at length about the meaning of a parable, but the debate shouldn't stop at just finding the meaning because the real point of the parable in the truth that it's trying to communicate is to invite us to live it out, to apply it, to put it into practice. So last week we spoke about how when we see the value of the kingdom of heaven, what will we pay for it? Will we begin to surrender to it? Will we begin to pour out our lives and allow the reign of God to enter into our lives? That needs to be applied. You can't just agree with the definition or disagree with it. You have to live it out. And that's part of what these parables are inviting people to do is wrestle with them and then put them into practice in their lives. Well, the parables we're going to pick up today come from Matthew 13, a little earlier than the ones from last week. It's from Matthew 13, verses 31, 32, and 33. Listen to what Jesus says. He, Jesus, told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that took a woman that, that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Well, 
He has a wrestle with these parables. Jesus doesn't interpret them for us. He lets us wrestle with them. And Matthew, uh, as he writes through his gospel, uh, invites us to wrestle with these parables and try to make sense of them. So we have two stories. We have a story about a seed, a mustard seed. Uh, Mustard seeds were pretty phenomenal in Jesus' day because they were so significant in terms of their scale that they took on proverbial status uh, for rabbis to teach. Uh, you may recognize this. This is one of those uh, vials that we use during our Let's Do This initiative. We invited people to take their faith as small as a mustard seed, Jesus once said, that could move mountains. So he has one mustard seed, and you can see it's this tiny little seed. Well, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this mustard seed. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, when it's planted and, and grows, it becomes the largest of garden plants, even becoming a tree. So we have this story of a seed germinating and growing and transforming. The other story, the other parable is about yeast. Yeast was a common everyday uh, ingredient in Jesus' time. As I said, they were using sourdough starters and even giving them as wedding gifts. Today, we kind of probably go and buy a packet like this, filled with the, the powdery form of what yeast is, this, uh, this uh, substance that will, uh, when fed with some sugar or some honey, will feed on that, will ferment, it will germinate, it will multiply, and it will expand and impact the dough that it's in, doubling it in size or even more, depending on how long you let it prove. Yeast also took on some proverbial status in Jesus' day. It was commonly used in a negative way. Yeast, because of its fermenting uh, attributes and the way it impacted and changed what it was in by infiltrating it, was often communicated as an evil thing. Don't let the evil of the world seep into you. Jesus even said, beware the yeast of the Pharisees at one point. But in this parable, it's not a negative connotation that Jesus brings. In fact, it's the opposite. It's a positive par parable. It's a positive use of what this ingredient, yeast, is. So we have two stories, a seed and yeast, two small, insignificant things that create powerful change and transformation. In the stories, we have two people, a man and a woman, each operating in different ways, but working with this ingredient that they have and doing something with it. Regardless of the story, whether it's a seed or the yeast or a man or a woman, the same outcome is the result in both stories. In both stories, a powerful transformation happens. For the seed, it dies, it takes root, and then grows into this large tree that birds can come and rest in. There's a change from a seed to a plant, a powerful transformation from within. And for the yeast, a small amount of yeast is worked into 60 pounds of flour. I, just for a moment, pause. I make uh, pizzas at home, right? I, I love making pizza for our kids. And I got really irritated at one point when we were buying pizzas. I remember one day specifically, I was at home alone. I decided to order my favorite pizza. And when it arrived, it cost me $20 for that pizza plus with delivery charges and all that sort of stuff. And I was like... I can make pizza for cheaper than that. So I began to make my own dough and working with yeast and pushing it all the way through the dough. Now, I make with my batch of dough that I put together, five pizza bases. It equates to eight cups of flour. It's not even close uh, to uh, two or three pounds of flour. This woman was taking a small amount of yeast and working it through 60 pounds of flour. The parable is trying to show the phenomenal power of the yeast to transform a large quantity of things. A small seed becoming a large tree, a small amount of yeast impacting a large amount of flour. A powerful transformation. And as you know, if you make your own bread, when you work the yeast through and once you finish doing that, you need to let the yeast rest. You need to let the, the bread, the flour and the dough rest. And as the yeast does its work, and as it ferments and multiplies, so the dough increases in size. And then you can knock it back and let it do it again and again. And you can do that over and over and over again, depending on what you're trying to make or, 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 or bake in your home. But the same outcome in the story. Powerful transformation, a change from this small yeast in this large amount of flour. 
So as we think about these parables, let's bring some questions to this parable to try to help us understand it and to begin to interpret it for ourselves. In this parable, who is the man or the woman in the stories? I think that's intriguing to look at. Commentators actually debate about whether the man and the woman is God doing the work or whether it's a disciple, a follower of Christ who does the work. I think it could be worked both ways. Depending on how you want to attribute this work, it could be God doing the work like the man planting the seed or the woman working the yeast into the dough. So it could be God doing the work of the kingdom of heaven. But it could also just as easily be us responding to the work of God, hearing the work of uh, the word of God and the will of God in our lives and beginning to apply it and work it into our lives. So I think you could take it either way that the man or the woman could be God or you in the story. Well, what is the seed or the yeast? Well, Jesus tells us that part. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. So they represent the kingdom of heaven. Now remember what we spoke about last week. The kingdom of heaven isn't a place. It isn't a country or a physical geographical area with boundaries. It's not an army. It's not a movement. The kingdom of heaven uh, is translated from Basilea to Theo. And Basilea means dominion. It means reign. It means rule. The kingdom of heaven is the rule of God in the world. It's his reign pressed out. It's his will listened to. And so Jesus is saying, this seed, this yeast is uh, the kingdom of heaven. So it's the reign of God. And so if it's us responding to the reign of God or God uh, sharing his rule and will with us, that's the beginning of the story. Well, then what is the garden in the story or what is the dough? I think that relates to uh, the world around us. That's the most obvious translation. The kingdom of heaven is coming in and it's going to impact and change the world. But I think you could also say that the garden or the dough is your life. It's your heart, your mind, your body, your sphere of influence, your family, your home. I think the, the scale of the garden or the dough could be applied in many different ways depending on how broadly you want to apply it. And then in the parable, we, we hear about birds and we don't get told who's going to eat the 60 pounds of flour that has become dough. I don't think the woman's going to eat that. Uh, 60 pounds of flour, that's quite a lot. And we know that the tree doesn't grow so that it can give itself shade. No, we're told about birds who come and rest in the branches of the tree. And I think the obvious account for 60 pounds of flour is that we are able to uh, share that with other people, that others will eat from this. I think what we're hearing here from the story is that the reign of God in our lives can be used. And as we are transformed, it will impact others. So what is the point of the parable? What is Jesus trying to teach us? I think Jesus is trying to teach us that the kingdom of heaven will create powerful transformation in your world, in your life, in your heart, in your body, in your mind. It will create powerful transformation, but you have to let it. The kingdom of God will create powerful transformation if you allow it to. Here's the amazing thing about the story. The size of the kingdom of heaven, the amount of the reign of God, the amount of his will that you respond to isn't significant. It's a small seed. It's a tiny amount of yeast. It's not about the size of the kingdom of heaven that is the pre uh, predicator of its impact. No, instead, it's your willingness to submit to what you know. As you submit to what you know about God's will, it produces profound impact, even flowing throughout your whole life. In fact, it goes further. It's going to pervade all of your life when you begin to submit to the reign of God, and it will produce change. But keep in mind that the change it's going to produce is in you, but also for others. As you are changed, it impacts others. As you are transformed, Others experience the blessing of that. As you begin to submit to the reign of God and see what he does for you, it begins to allow others to experience that as well. 
So the most obvious question, if that is what the point of the parable is, that the kingdom of heaven will create powerful transformation in me if I allow it to, how does the kingdom of heaven create change? Well, it's in the story. A seed creates change when it takes root in the ground and begins to transform into the plant. The yeast creates change when it is worked through the dough. So the kingdom of heaven can create change in our lives when we allow the will of God, the word of God, the reign of God to take root in our lives, to be worked through our lives. Now, I don't want to uh, share with you something that's just positive. I want you to know that this requires suffering. You see, for the root to push through the soil, for the plant to grow, the seed has to die. There needs to be some sort of suffering. For the yeast to ferment and multiply, it has to be pushed through the dough. And if you've ever uh, taken dough and worked on it and pushed it, it takes some effort. It takes some time to work that dough and roll it and, and smack it around. I love doing it. It's kind of your gym workout, right? As you're pushing and rolling the dough around, you can punch it. I remember standing at the counter and my son and I, who the son who loves cooking, we would sit there, and punch the dough together and work on it and just to have fun doing it. But it took effort. It took some suffering. The kingdom of heaven, if it's going to take root in our lives, is going to require suffering and uh, hard work from us. But as we allow it to come into our lives, as we do the hard work that it requires, as we limit ourselves, we begin to experience that change because it begins to take root. So how do you let the word of God or the will of God, the reign of God, the kingdom of heaven, take root in you or work through you? Well, I'd encourage you, if you are not a Christian, if you're having questions about who Jesus is and you haven't yet surrendered your life to him and become what we call a Christian uh, by committing your life to Christ, that's where you want to begin. You want to begin with a simple affirmation. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, which is a way of saying, I submit to you, Jesus, and we believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. If you're at that point, the parable is inviting you to accept that seed, to welcome that yeast, to allow that to begin to take root in your life. You may have lots of questions about that. You may not quite understand what all of those things mean. Well, I want to encourage you, please come and join a group we have called Starting Point. It's a wonderful program where you can ask deep questions and you can engage in good conversations around what it means to have faith, what faith looks like, and who Jesus is and how you might commit your life to him. We offer it here in Hopkinton. It, there's a group going already that began in January 9th. You can sign up for it. You can still join it now. Or if you're not ready, wait for the next one. In Framingham, we're going to have a virtual group that will start on January 23rd. Check it out. Sign up for it. It's going to be remote, so you can join it no matter what campus you're from. It's a good place to ask questions. But maybe you're at a place to make that commitment. Well, then I would simply invite you to say that. Lord Jesus Christ, I confess that you are my Lord and I call you to live in me. And that's the beginning process. Now, that's if you're not a believer. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ then how do you allow the reign of God to take root in you or be worked through you? I think one of the best ways you can do this is by practicing spiritual disciplines or practicing spiritual rhythms in your life. Richard Foster wrote a great book called Celebration of Discipline and Ruth Haley Barton wrote a book called Sacred Rhythms where you can learn about these rhythms. The obvious rhythms that we talk about or disciplines are things like reading your Bible and praying. I'd encourage you, if you haven't yet, start to read your Bible. In fact, this year, why don't you grab uh, a version of the Bible called The Story? The Story is a way to read through the whole Bible. It looks more like a novel than, than like um, some of those academic Bibles you see. And it kind of takes out all of the passages that most people skip over. You know, the, the, the genealogies and the lists and the numbers. And it tries to contain uh, the core uh, scriptures that tell the story of God working with his people. That's a great place to start is pick up the story and begin to read through it. Uh, or if you want to download the Bible app 
and begin to just read one of the Gospels. Maybe Matthew, start at Matthew 1 and just catch up to where we are. That is one of the spiritual disciplines, reading God's Word. The other is praying. Prayer doesn't need to be this weird mystical thing. Prayer at its simplest is just talking to God about what's going on in your life. Like you talk to your partner or you talk to your friends. Prayer is talking to God. You don't need to use special language. You don't need to uh, curate your words to be special or, or, or complex. You can just talk to Him simply and openly. You can be angry with God. You can express your emotions to God. You can tell Him about your frustrations and your fears. You can tell Him about your joys and what you're happy about. Prayer can be something you can do any moment of the day and every moment of the day. Those are two simple disciplines, but there's so many others. We have in God's Word this discipline of study, studying God's Word, diving deep, opening it up, talking about it with other people. We have these outward disciplines that Richard Foster talks about. Things like simplicity, saying no to things in your life and living simply and focused with clarity so that you can uh, not be overwhelmed by busyness in your life. He talks about uh, disciplines like solitude, choosing to step away from other relationships for a period of time to hear God's word better. There's disciplines like uh, silence so that we still our mouths, so we can still our minds, so we can still our hearts. And hopefully as we go through that process of silence, we hear God speaking more clearly. There's disciplines like service, serving God with your gifts and resources. And if you maybe have dropped out of that uh, because of the pandemic, I encourage you, pick that back up again. Use your gifts, serving God's kingdom. We would love to have you serve here. In fact, we need you to serve here. So that's a great way to allow the reign of God to take root in your life as you celebrate discipline of service. There's still more that we had it earlier as we prayed about Martin Luther King, the discipline of confession, where we confess our sins to other people and we allow God to uh, forgive us of our sins. And the idea of confessing to somebody else is about accountability, about making it public. But you can also confess your sins to God. But a good discipline of the Christian faith is the discipline of confession, regularly reminding ourselves of where we have failed so that we can rely on the grace of God even more. Another discipline we have is worship. Worship is the discipline of community gathering together to re remind ourselves of who God is and to glorify Him and lift His name up. Worship services are not about the preacher. It's not about the band. It's not about the building. Worship services are about us coming together to tell God who He is and let Him speak to us. And we do it in community. So I would encourage you in a safe way when you feel comfortable doing it, Get back into a community close to you. Come and serve, worship in a church with other people. There's something different about being with others. And let's face it, you've even admitted it yourself. It's not the same to watch the service at home. Now, I get it. We're in a COVID world. There's a, a, a surge going on. So I'm not saying that you should be risky or be unsafe. But I am saying is don't forget to meet together with others. Because as we do that, we celebrate a discipline that allows the reign of God to take root in our lives and that will transform us. People are changed in worship. There's still other uh, disciplines that we talk about, disciplines of celebration and gathering with others. Uh, there's just so many different ways to allow the rhythms of spirituality to take root in your lives. But you know what all of them have in common? That the yeast and the seed highlight is that it takes time. It took time for that seed to take root and grow into the plant. It takes time for yeast to impact the whole dough. And in the same way, the reign of God needs to be welcomed into your life. And it's not going to produce the change you want instantly. It's going to take time. I love the illustration of marinating meat. That when we allow the reign of God to come into us, it's like taking a beautiful ribeye steak putting your seasoning on it or letting it soak in a marinade. And in order for that to be impactful on that meat, for the meat to be transformed, it's to allow the spices to soak into the meat or to allow the, the sauce that you've created to rest on that meat. And the longer it does that to the meat, the more tender that meat is. And if you're a griller, you know that sometimes the best way to cook that meat is slowly, hours, will translate to your life for the reign of God to transform your whole life, 
It might take days, weeks, months, even years. But the parable is trying to teach us that the kingdom of heaven will produce transformation in you if you allow it to take root, if you endure the suffering and allow it to transform you. Which leads to my takeaway for you from this whole message. When you allow the reign of God to take root in your life, it will produce incredible change within you. But more, it will then also allow others to benefit. So when you allow the reign of God to take root in your life, it will produce incredible change in you and then through you to benefit others. And man, we have uh, heard over the last few weeks stories of how God has just done that. If you were able to listen to uh, the Barnabas uh, ministries come and speak about the impact of their work with pastors and how it has transformed communities, you began to see just how the reign of God taking root in people could transform and benefit others. You heard about Straight Ahead when they preached on January 2nd and how their work with juveniles in the, in the court systems began to create incredible change in the lives of people. That is the kingdom of heaven taking root. And as a church, we are committed to the work in Madagascar. Our work in Madagascar is to partner with Island Missions, uh, which is headed up by Dina. Dina, who is a pastor, has a phenomenal story of how Island Missions came about. And it began because he allowed a seed to take root in his life, that God was calling him to submit to something. And he submitted to that reign of God in his life, and it created a profound impact. Listen to what happened with Dina. Dina, he grew up in a Christian family, uh, and his mother actually pastored a small church uh, in uh, Antananarivo. I'm terrible at that name, but it's the capital of Madagascar. That's where Dina grew up. Uh, there, he, as he grew up in that church, he felt a call from God to spread the gospel to people who had never heard of Christ in the island of Madagascar. Eventually, he responded to that call. And so for him, the way he responded, the way he submitted and allowed that seed to begin to take root is he got in a taxi. He told the taxi driver, drive me to the edge of uh, as far as you can into the rainforest. Just take, go as far as you can into the rainforest and drop me off there. I'm sure the taxi driver thought he was crazy, but he drove him out there. He dropped him off. He paid the taxi driver. Taxi driver left. And Dina turned around and walked into the forest and kept walking until he came to the first village. He got to that first village and he spoke to the first person he could. And then he spoke to another and another. And he kept talking to people until he found a person who would respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. To the first person who committed their life to Christ. And he then went back over and over again. And he started sharing more and more until not more than just that Christ follower happened. He kept returning until another person did it and another person did until in that village more and more people had and they began to tell him there are other villages. So he would recruit people and as he worked with those followers he would then send them out going out into the forest. He, they would go to more villages and Dina found himself moving from a person sharing the faith one on one to somebody who had to start mentoring others and training others using Christ's model of discipling others one on one. Slowly what happened is as Dina shared the gospel and these others he was mentoring shared the gospels, churches began to be planted in these villages. They began to grow disciples and they began to ask for somebody from their village to be trained, to be a pastor, to be leaders or elders in their community and to help others be trained in evangelism. And so Dina began to do that and continue to do that and press that out. And so he worked and as the church movement grew and grew, they began to grow from place to place. The structure grew and the training of leaders began to be so complex that eventually he had to form this mission organization called Island Missions. We are partnering with Island Missions, but because of Dina's submission to that first little seed that over the years took root and grew, today 11,050 churches have been planted in the rainforest of Madagascar. Just listen to that. Because a man submitted to walk into a forest and begin to talk to one person, today 11,050 churches have been planted in the rainforests of Madagascar. 884 
70,000 people have given their lives to Christ and 76,000 Bibles have been distributed to the churches because one man allowed the reign of God to take root in his life. It grew into a plant bigger than any garden. It grew into a tree where thousands of people could rest in the branches of Dina's submission. The yeast of Dina's submission worked through the rainforest of Madagascar creating change. They're now working on translating the Bible into all 18 major dialects of Malagasy. 12 of them are completed and the other six should be done in the next two years. They're working hard at that. They're working harder. They've actually just started on the Old Testament in three of the main uh, dialects and are working at it. For Dina, he would say that this parable is not about uh, if, it's about how. How do you submit to the reign of God? How do I make it happen? How do I keep doing that work? And we're partnering with Dina to help him in that work. At his request, he said he needs help training pastors. So we're using um, the uh, peace plan from Saddleback. And we're partnering with them and doing phenomenal training with them. But actually, I think we're learning far more in the process. Dina is a far more prolific church planter and evangelist than I've ever been, than we've ever been. He's doing phenomenal work. And so we're getting to partner with him. But imagine now, just for a moment, what would happen in your life if you submitted to that seed that you hear God saying to you? Where is God calling you to submit to his reign in your life? Is it committing your life to Christ? Do it today. Is it surrendering that piece or that closet or that part of your life that you haven't yet allowed the reign of God to seep into? Do it today. Find a way to Submit to God to allow Him to, His reign to uh, transform your life. Begin that work today and just imagine what God might do in and through you for the benefit of others, for your benefit as well. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. And when it takes root in your life, when it is worked through your life, it will transform you and it will even benefit others. I want to pray for you that you would experience that in your life. Heavenly Father, I pray for each person listening to us that they would hear your word. Lord, each person knows where the reign of God is in their life that they are being asked to submit to. You are speaking to each person through your spirit. They know what they need to surrender. I pray, Lord, that you would pour courage on each person that they would have the courage to surrender to you. They would have the faith to submit to you. And that they would begin now to experience the transforming power of your reign, your will in their lives. Lord, pour out your spirit and create powerful change in the lives of people who are listening to this. So that your kingdom would grow. So that your kingdom would expand. So that what you came to do, which was usher in the kingdom of heaven, that what you began to do would continue in this generation and into the next generation. Lord, may we be a church of people who grow in Christ likeness from generation to generation until you return and may it continue with us. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen.